Hello and welcome to Mapping Fault Lines, a show by NewsClick, where we look at some of the major geopolitical issues around the world. Today, we're going to be focusing on the Central Asian region where a lot of developments have been happening over the past few weeks. There is, of course, the conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan, which you've been talking about, which has led to hundreds of deaths, a long standing conflict, in fact. And today, there's been news that a missile attack on Azerbaijan's second largest city, Ganja, has killed nearly 13 people. And this was after the ceasefire was declared. Meanwhile, some distance away in Kyrgyzstan, there's been a major political change. A long-term president has been forced to step down after protests. And Sadir Japirov, who is considered a nationalist politician and who was serving a jail term on kidnapping charges, has been released after the protests and has now been appointed the president. So a lot of changes happening, of course, and a lot of influence, a lot of roles being played by regional, uh, big countries in the region, such as Russia, Turkey, Iran. And of course, there's the US and Israel, countries like the US and Israel also exerting influence. So we have Prabir Purkaisa to talk about this. Prabir, so uh, we've seen this region always being the site of a lot of, uh, say, conflicts, a lot of machinations by powers, even who are not part of the region, such as the United States. We're talking color revolutions, for, of course, have, uh, for example, happen in many of these places. So how do you see the latest developments in this region and what do they imply? I think it's very clear now that the United States has decided that it needs to enter the, uh, the Caucasus and also Central Asia, not with a view to really taking over some parts of it or trying to control the region or getting people, countries to become members of the NATO. I think that part of it has sort of uh, given up and I'll come to why this has been given up for the time being. But they also would like to keep the pot boiling. And there is, uh, the, of course, Russia is one element in this, targeting Russia in different ways, but also China, because Kyrgyzstan is right next to the Uyghur uh, Xinjiang uh, province. Uh, that, as you know, is the target for the United States. It's become something of uh, a global attack, which has been unleashed, making that as a key issue. And a part of it that is to also deflect the rising Islamophobia in the United States and uh, Europe and deflecting attention on to saying, oh, you know, China is Islamophobic. We are okay. We are part from the course, but look at what they're doing there. So making the pic, com, com, giving a picture that they're doing much worse than we are doing. So, you know, you guys don't have to worry about us so much kind mm -hmm. of thing. Mm -hmm. So I think what you see in this, whether it's a Caucasus or you see uh, Central Asian republics, that the U.S. is trying to really fish in very troubled waters, not with a view to stabilizing the region or really building alliances which can last. I think that view that they might have had one point, they've given up. At the moment, they are looking for how to destabilize these areas and therefore keep Russia and China on the defensive because these are unstable borders that in uh, very close to their uh, countries. And this also uh, it gives them a handle against Turkey and Iran. Turkey has having fallen out with NATO and the United States. It wants to play a lone hand. So there is also that element. So what you see at the moment is a really a destabilizing of the region and which we don't know which side, to, what is going to happen, what are the alignments possible. But your four major players of the region which is Turkey, you have Iran, you have China, you have Russia. And all four of them uh, can be destabilized one way or the other right. by playing on the regional passions in the region. Because there are a large number of Turkic um, nationality, meaning language speakers in this region. And a lot of the Central Asian republics, we can go over their names, including Kyrgyz, Kyrgyzstan, and Azerbaijan speak the Turkic language. And therefore, Turkey believes that it has an affinity towards them. Azerbaijan is Shia. Right. So Iran has some affinity over that. It's possible they could feel 
a certain linkage with Azerbaijan. So you have all kinds of cross currents that, that are there. Right. Kyrgyzstan also speaks a Turki, Turkic language. So you have that kind of influence Turkey might try and assert using their linguistic uh, affinity. All of this means that the US policy is no longer to try and expand its influence as much as to disrupt the others. What I would call is a policy of chaos that if we can't have it, nobody else should. It right. seems to be the policy they're playing. And that would explain why they're quite okay with the conflict in uh, Nagorno-Karabakh between Armenia and Azerbaijan, as well as what the uh, destabilizing uh, efforts which were there in Kyrgyzstan, which didn't want uh, Sadir uh, Zaparov to come into power, in fact, wanted more instability over there. It's quite unhappy that uh, Sadr Zaparov seems to have taken over and seems to have a certain amount of legitimacy at the moment. So I think all of this is something that we need to look upon as a US policy of destabilizing regions rather than expanding its influence. And I think that's the key now to understand what's happening in these regions. Praveen, in this context, uh, the developments around in Kyrgyzstan are quite significant because we've seen, of course, a lot of key players here. The current president, the, the former president who just resigned, of course, is a key player. But there's also Sadr Japarov, who has become, uh, who has been nominated by parliament to be the new president. And there's also a former leader, uh, Al Mazbek Atambay, who's really considered one of the key uh, major players in the politics of the country itself. And of course, like you said, it's close to China and it's also a traditional ally of Russia. So uh, how do you see the developments that are happening around there? Well, Bhadra Kumar has written a detailed piece that he thinks that this was really an attempted color revolution in which mm -hmm. the United States played a key role, right. but or at least supported sections which were trying to take power over there. Uh, it, it seems to be that that ploy has not worked. Right. And you have uh, Sadir Jafarov uh, sees power and he was essentially uh, freed by the um, demonstrators mm -hmm. who then put pressure on the president to resign yeah. and yeah. hand over power uh, yeah. to Z Jafarov. Mm -hmm. Now, given all of this, uh, why would be the question to ask is why is the United States interested in Kyrgyzstan? After all, mm -hmm. it's a small place. It doesn't exactly. really have a major role to play. Right. It's not rich in uh, minerals, unlike, for instance, Azerbaijan, which has a lot of oil and gas wealth. So what is the reason for this? It's also, as I said, not very big. And the argument is, well, it is Turkic speaking. It is people who are the, could be close to the Uyghurs right. and who are also Turkic, Turk, Turkic speaking. Mm -hmm. So it could be a base by which you could actually destabilize a right. part of China. Right. So I think its strategic importance to the United States was more its potential being used as a stalking horse in uh, Xinjiang. Right. And that was the reason that there is a, a sense of disappointment right. that the cards did not fall in a way that would have helped this effort. But uh, Sadir Japarov has taken over and it appear, doesn't appear that he has those kind of intentions to ally with the United States. If you look at the geopolitical situation, there's no particular reason why any of these small republics uh, would align with the United States. Because on one side, they have China. There is, of course, in this particular case, that we have about five or six Turkic language speaking countries. But none of them really have any say, connection uh, to United States or its allies through any land boundary. On one side, you have China, other side of Iran, you have other side, you have Russia. So in, in that sense, none of these countries then can provide a direct lifeline right. if they get into trouble. So only thing that the United States can pro provide is air lifting, air support, and so on. So it doesn't look like in a geostrategic sense, any of these countries would really readily fall into the hands of the United States unless they decide that we are so much indebted to the U.S. Uh, as, a, as a political power that we are willing to sacrifice our country to further 
strategic interests of the US. Right. And I think that's an unlikely occurrence. But let's not forget, Pakistan is also a close ally of China at the moment. Mm -hmm. Afghanistan is something that the, the United States is uh, going away from. So there is really no base that the US has today to right. intervene in, in this particular region. And therefore, as I said, it again comes back. They don't really care. What they yeah. want is to destabilize the region and keep Russia and China occupied and maybe also Iran, which also abuts the region. So they have no stake in stability of the world at the moment. I think this is only an example of that. And Prabir, one of the key aspects, of course, is that we've also, like I mentioned earlier, seen a history of uh, color revolutions in certain other parts of the region, of course, not necessarily in center in the part around Kyrgyzstan, but for instance, in uh, Ukraine, definitely. Even for that matter, there have been similar incidents in Georgia, Armenia itself. So could you also take us through the kind of uh, regional dimensions that are there in this part of the world and the kind of various complications that they bring? You know, three regions are crucial here. When you talk about Ukraine and so on, you're really talking about the uh, Baltic. Uh, that as the That region is what is being put into play. At the moment, what we are looking at, particularly with these two countries, Azerbaijan, Armenia, and Kyrgyzstan, you are looking at Caucasus and you are looking at uh, Central Asia as the play, as the as a uh, playground, so to say, of this of the United States and its uh, what its intent could be. Right. So I leave the Baltics out for the time being because we have talked about it earlier quite a bit. What we the, would, what we should see is that if we look at Turkey and if we look at Russia, then you will see that it, of course, abuts Black Sea. That's the place where both of them have uh, naval power. And if you take Georgia's attempt to really try and take back Abkhazia and uh, South Ossetia, Abkhazia has, of course, a sea, uh, but it's a, it abuts again the Black Sea. So there is a geostrategic issue which the United States was trying to use Georgia for. Having failed that, having seen that it was not possible and Georgia could not enter the NATO because there is a clause in NATO which says if you are having territorial disputes and an armed uh, secession of some kind, then you cannot be a member of the NATO. Right. And that was because NATO doesn't want to be get doesn't want to get dragged into what it considers a civil war situation. And that means neither Georgia nor Ukraine at the moment can actually enter the NATO. And even if the US wants them to join, I think other powers really don't want that to happen because they right. believe that they could be involved in a situation of war. Right. So I think Baltics has, in that sense, reached a quasi-stability after the Belarus, what happened, and, you know, those kind of attempts which were tried over there, I think that is sort of now settling down to a situation of a, again a status quo in which US has not been able to do what you just talked about, a color revolution. But it doesn't mean its inter interests have receded over there. I think that will still continue. But I think that right now the focus has shifted to Armenia, Azerbaijan, and that basically thinking if Russia, Turkey, and Iran can be engaged over there, that, that will keep the pot boiling and all three of them then cannot come together very easily. Right. But it does seem that Russia has played a relatively neutral role. Hmm. It, I think, allowed the war to play out for a little bit uh, till both sides realized they're not going to make much head away. Right. And after that, they, I think Russia has been trying to sort of put them make them sit at the table and bang a few heads and get some status quo ante back over there. Right. Both Turkey, though there was a lot of talk about Turkey's support and so on, Turkey's support has been there, but it's more, seems to be more, uh, you know, moral support than a physical one. Though right. there have been claims that Turkish Air Force was used, I don't think that much of it should be really considered serious. And neither Iran, has been drawn into the battle. Right. So Russia's ability to actually make them sit and come to an understanding and some kind of a ceasefire, even if it is not holding fully, 
I don't think it's going to get back into war because both sides seems to have realized that this is the war that neither side will win. Exactly. For Armenia and Azerbaijan, the real issue is that it's not only Nagorno-Karabakh. Armenia is sitting on territory which it also accepts that mm. that was not an Armenian, um, the people of Armenian identity, so to say, were not the people in those parts of Azerbaijan, which it right. really took over. Right. And therefore, that that part of it that they should also keep, which is what they're planning now, is in fact something Azerbaijan is not willing to accept. Azerbaijan has a lot of oil, as you know. And at one point, the US was trying to cultivate Azerbaijan uh, using Georgia. There, was all, there is a pipeline which runs up to Sehan in Turkey, which therefore comes not to the Black Sea, but the other side. So you get it really on the Indian Ocean, Persian Gulf side. Right. So there was this attempt to really provide Turkey with an uh, outlet. And this is the outlet for Baku, Azerbaijan. And this would, in that sense, be a competition to Russia. Now, with what is happening, the fact that Turkey is no longer the ally, all these plans have really gone up into thin air. And therefore, you now see Azerbaijan, Armenia, it's become a really a local conflict. And a U.S. Israel has attempts to, you know, attempted to play some uh, mischievous role over there. Right. But Armenia is not pro-Russia in that particular way. Azerbaijan has been close to NATO, and the argument was that Turkey would really control Azerbaijan. That's not happening in, in this, at least in the very, you know, at least in terms of. Uh, Keeping Azerbaijan, bringing it to NATO, that is not happening. But Tur Turkey itself has got out of NATO exactly. virtually. So right. given all of this, it's difficult to see how this uh, forces will play, except to come to some understanding and probably sit down and negotiate at least those enclaves which Armenia has taken over, which are not Armenian majority, which they have really driven out the Azerbaijani ethnic population from there, whether that can be negotiated into a settlement by which Nagorno-Karabakh gets integrated in Armenia, and in lieu of that, those portions of territory is given back. If that doesn't happen, it will still going to continue to be a festering sore in the relationship of the two countries. But I don't think it's going to be now spinning into a war, which will see other global players come. Right, right, absolutely. Thank you so much, Praveen, for talking to us. That's all we have time for today. Keep watching News Click.